Speed on the lead, February 9th, 2015. This is NATV 110, Section 1, the Calculus Run. Today is day number 11 in the semester, and it's week number 6. Just one week more before the Chinese New Year. So let's get started. So, welcome back. Um, this week, we're going to take a light approach into reviewing what you need to do, but uh, basically results are very important because if you look at your textbook, all right, if you look at the textbook, we're going to help you understand sections 3.5 today. If you can turn to your page 146 on your textbook, 146 on your textbook, this is a section which we have not touched ever since the first couple of weeks, although we hold you responsible for getting yourself review for this section on this maximum and minimum and second derivative. It's a very important uh, lecture delivered by Professor Gilbert Swan in order to help you understand the big picture of calculus. And this week, today we're going to review this in order to help you understand sections of five. And then on the first day, we're going to come back to the exponential functions again. So, um, in the course, you received my teacher's message for last week. You are going to have a quiz this Wednesday, and you have another piece of homework number four to be turned in. And your next journal will be due on March the 4th. So, get ready for your quiz this Wednesday, which covers section also 3.5. So, are you ready for? Professor Gilbert's run is about 40 minutes. Okay, please pay attention. Example. 
distance, speed, acceleration. I say physics because, of course, acceleration is the A in Newton's law, F equal MA. But for a graph, like these graphs here, I won't especially use those physics words, I'll use graph words. So I would say function one would be the height of the graph. And in this case, that height is y equal x squared. So it's a simple parabola. Here would be the slope. I would use the word slope for the second function. And the slope of y equal x squared, we know, is 2x. So we see the slope increasing. And, and you see on this picture, the slope is increasing. As I go, as x increases, the, I'm going up more steeply. Now, it's the second derivative. And what shall I call that? Bending. Bending is the natural word for the second derivative on a graph. And what do I, the second, the derivative of 2x is 2, a constant, a positive constant. And that positive constant tells me that the slope is going upwards and that the curve is bending up. So in this simple case, we, we connect these three uh, descriptions of our function. It's positive, its slope is positive, and its second derivative, bending, is positive. And that gives us a function that goes like that. Now, let me go to a different function. Let me take uh, a second example now. A, a, a more, a more uh, an example where not everything is positive. So I'll take, uh, let my, but let's take it, make it familiar. Take sine x. So sine x starts out like that. So this is a graph of sine x up to 90 degrees, pi over 2. So that's y equals sine x. OK, what do you think about its slope? We, we know the derivative of sine x, but before we write it down, look at the graph. The slope is positive, right? But the slope is, starts out, actually starts out as 1. Uh, make it look a little more realistic. That's a slope of 1 there. The slope starts at 1. And the slope drops to a slope of 0 up there. So a slope of 1, I see here as a 1. Here I'm graphing y prime. In y dx, I sometimes write as y prime, just because it's shorter. And particularly, it'll be shorter for a second derivative. So y prime, we know the derivative of sine x is cos x. which is pretty neat. The, the, we start with a familiar function and then we get its twin, its, its, its other half. And the cosine is the slope of the sine curve. And it starts at 1, the slope of 1, and it comes down to 0. As we know, the cosine does. So that's a graph of the cosine. And now, of course, we have three generations. I'm going to graph y double prime. Let me put it up here. y double prime, the second derivative. The derivative of the cosine of x is minus sine x. OK, let's just, from the picture, what am I seeing here? I'm seeing a slope of 0. I'm taking now the slope of the slope. So here it starts at 0. The slope is downwards. So the second derivative is going to be negative. Oh, and it is negative, minus sign. So it's, the slope starts at 0. And ends at minus 1. So because that now comes down at a, at a slope of a negative slope. The slope is negative. I'm going downhill. And 
That's a graph of the second derivative. And which way is our function bending? It's bending down. As I go along, the slope is dropping. And I see that in the slope curve, it's falling. And I see it in the bending curve because I'm below, below zero here. This is, a, this is bending down. Where that one was bending up, let me, I could introduce the word convex for something that bends upwards. And bending down, I could introduce the word concave. But those are just words. The graphs are telling us much more than the words. OK. So do you see that picture bending down but going up? So the slope is positive here. But the second derivative, the slope is dropping. So the second derivative, and it's, you have to pay attention to keep them straight. The, the second derivative is telling us that the original one is bending down. OK. Let me continue these graphs just a little beyond 90 degrees, pi over 2 because you'll see something interesting. So what happens in the next part of the graph? So this is going, the sine curve, of course, continues on its way downwards. So the slope is going negative, as I know the cosine curve will do. The cosine curve will come like that. The slope down to minus 1. The slope, do you see here, the slope is negative. So on this slope graph, I'm below zero. And the slope is, the slope is zero. Let, let me put a little mark at these points here. Yeah, at these three points. So with the, uh, those, the, the, that was important. Those are important points. In fact, that is a maximum, of course. The, co the sine curve hits its maximum at 1. At that point, when it hits its maximum, what's its slope? When you hit a maximum, you're not going up anymore. You haven't started down. The slope is 0, right there. What's the second derivative? What's the bending at a maximum? The bending tells you that the slope is going down, so the bending is negative. The bending in the, is negative at a maximum. Good. OK. Now I'm going to con continue this sine curve for another 90 degrees, the cosine curve, and I'll continue the bending curve. So I have minus sine x, which will go back up. OK. Now what? Now what? I, and, and then it, of course it would continue along. OK, there's something interesting happening at 180 degrees, I pop. Can I identify that point? So there's 180 degrees. Something's happening there. I don't see, I don't quite know how to say what yet, but something's happening there. It's got to be, it's got to show up here, and it has to show up here. So whatever is happening is showing up by a point where y double prime, the second derivative, is zero. Why would? That's my new little observation. Not as big a deal as maximum or minimum. This was a max here. And we identified it as a max because the second derivative was negative. Now I'm interested in this point. Can you see what's happening at this point as far as bending goes? This curve is bending down. But when I continue, the bending changes to up. This is a point 
where the bending changes. The second derivative changes sign, and we see it here. Both up to this square point, the bending is below zero. The bending is downwards as I come to here. But then there's something rather special that you see, can I try to blow that point up? Here, it's, here the bending is down and there it turns to up and right in there with the, with the, this is called, so this is my final word to introduce, inflection point. Don't ask me what. An inflection point is a point where the second derivative is zero. And what does that mean? That means it's at that moment, it stopped bending down and it's going to start bending up. If the second derivative is passing through zero, the bending, the sign of bending is changing. It's changing from concave here to convex there. That's a, a, a significant point on the graph. Not as big a thing as the max or the min that we have over there. So let me draw one more example and identify all these different points. Okay, so here we go. I drew it ahead of time because it's got a few loops and I wanted to get it in good form. Okay, here it is. This is my function, x cubed minus x squared. Well, before I look at the picture, what would be, what's the first calculus thing I do? I take the derivative. y prime is the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared minus the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. And now, today, I take the derivative of that. I take the second derivative, y double prime. So the second derivative the deri is the derivative of this. x squared is going to give me 2x, and I have a 3, so it's all together 6x. And minus 2x, the slope of that is minus 2. Right? Cubic, quadratic, linear, and if I cared about y triple prime, which I don't, constant. And then the fourth derivatives and all the, all the rest would be zero for this. Okay, now somehow those derivatives, those formulas for the for y, y prime, y double prime, should tell me details about this graph. And the first thing I'm interested in, and the most important thing, is max and min. So let me set y prime to be, which is 3x squared, I'll set the minus 2x, I'll set it to be 0, because I want to look for max or min. And I look for both at the same time by setting y prime equals zero. And then I find out which I've got by looking at y double prime. So let me set y prime to be zero. What are the solutions? Where are the points on the curve where it's stationary? It's not climbing and it's not dropping. Well, I see them on the curve here. That's, that is a point where the slope is zero. And I see one down here. There is a point where the slope is zero. And, and that, but I can find them with algebra. I solve 3x squared equal to 2x. And I see it's a quadratic equation. I expect to find two roots. One of them is x equals 0. And the other one is what? If I cancel those x's to find a non-zero, so it's canceling those x's leaves me with 3x equal 2 or x equal 2 thirds. Yeah, and that's what, we, what our graph shows. OK. Now, we can see on the graph which is a max and which is a min. And, and by the way, just let me just notice, of course, this is the max. But let me just 
just notice that it's what I would call a local maximum. It's not the absolute top of the function because the function later on is climbing off to infinity. This would be a, a maximum in its neighborhood. So it's a maximum and it's only a local maximum. And what do I expect to see at a maximum? At x equals zero. I expect to see the slope zero at x equals zero, which it is, check. And at a maximum, I expect, to, I need to know uh, the second derivative. Okay, here's my formula. At x equals zero, I see y double prime if x is zero is minus two. Good. Negative second derivative tells me I'm bending down, as the graph confirms. And the place where the slope is zero is a maximum and not a minimum. What about the other one? What about at x equal two thirds? At that point, y double prime, looking at my formula here for y double prime, is what? Six times two thirds is four, minus two is plus two. Four minus two is two. So this will be, this is positive, so I'm expecting a min. At x equal two thirds, I'm expecting a min. And of course, it is. And again, it's only a local minimum. The derivative can only tell you what's happening very, very close to that point. The derivative doesn't know that over here, the function is going further down. So this is a min, and again, a local. Okay. Those are maximum and minimum when we know the function. Oh yeah, I better do the inflection point. Remember what the inflection point is. The inflection point is when the bending changes from uh, up to here, I see that bending down. From here, I see it bending up. So I will not be surprised if that's the point where the bending is changing and one third is the inflection point. And now how do we find an inflection point? How do we identify this point? Well, y double prime was negative. y double prime was positive. At that point, y double prime is zero. This is an inflection point and it is at x equal to one-third, at x equal one-third, I do have six times one-third, two, subtract two, I have zero. So that is truly an inflection point. Uh, and now I know all the essential points about the curve. And, and this is the kind of quantity, these are the quantities of, oh, say you're an economist, you're looking now at the at the uh, statistics for the U.S. economy or the world at time. Okay, I suppose uh, we're in a, we had a local maximum there. A uh, happy time, a little while ago. But it went downhill, right? If this is, if Y is say the total, the gross national, the gross product for the world or gross national product. It started down. The slope of that curve was negative. The bending was even negative. It was going down faster all the time. Now, at a certain moment, it's kept the economy kept going down, but you could see some sign of hope. And what was the sign of hope? It was the fact that it started bending up. And probably that's where we are as I'm making this video. I suspect we're still going down, but we're bending up. And at some point, hopefully tomorrow, we'll hit minimum and start really up. So I don't know, I would guess we're somewhere in there and I don't know where. If I knew where, uh, mathematics would be even more useful than it is which would be hard to do.
Okay, so that's an example of how the, third, the second derivative comes in. Now, I started by giving this lecture the title Max and Min. And those, are, I'm saying, those are the biggest applications of the derivative. Set the derivative to zero and solve. Locate maximum points, minimum points. That's what uh, calculus is most, many of the word problems, most of the ones I see in use involve derivative equals zero. Okay, so let me take uh, a particular example. So I'm going to, so these were graphs, simple functions, which I chose, sine x, x squared, x cubed minus x squared. Now let me choose, let me, let me tell you the problem, because this is how math really comes. Let me tell you the problem and let's create the function. Okay, so my, it's the problem I face this morning and every morning. I live here, so okay, so here's home. And there is a, the Mass Pike is the fast road uh, to MIT. So let me put in the Mass Pike. And let's say that's MIT. And I'm trying to get there as fast as possible. Okay. So, for part of the time, I'm going to have to drive on city streets. I do have to drive on city streets. And then I get to go on the mass bike, which is, let's say, twice as fast. Uh, the question is, where should I go directly over to the fast road and then take off? Let's take off on a good morning. The mass pipe could be twice as slow, but where will it assume twice as fast? Should I go straight over? Probably not. That's, that's, uh, that's not the best way. I should probably pick up the mass pipe on some road. I could go directly to MIT on the city streets at the slow rate. Say, say 30 miles an hour, or 30 kilometers an hour, and 60. So speeds 30 and 60 as my speeds. Okay. So, and now I, I should have put in some measure. Let, let's call that distance A, whatever it is. Maybe it's about three miles. And let me call this. So that's the direct distance. If I just went direct to the turnpike, I would go a distance A at 30 miles an hour, and then I would go a distance, so I call that B, at 60. So that's one possibility. But I think it's not the best. I think better to, and you know better than me, I think I should probably angle over here and pick up this. Uh, my question is, where should I join the mass pipe? And, and let's so we get a calculus problem. Let's model it. Suppose that I can join it anywhere I like. Not just at a couple of uh, entrances. Anywhere. And the question is where? So, so calculus deals with the continuous choice of x. So this is, that is the unknown. I can take that as the unknown x. That was a key step, of course, deciding what should be the unknown. I could also have taken this angle as an unknown, and uh, that would be uh, quite neat, too. But let me take that x. So this distance is then b minus x. So that's what I travel on the mass pipe. So my time to minimum. I'm trying to minimize my time. Okay. So on this mass pipe, when I travel at 60, I have distance divided by 60 is the time, right? Am I remembering correctly? Let's just remember. Distance is speed times time. That's the one we know. And then if I divide by the speed, 
the time is the distance divided by the speed, the distance divided by the speed on the plane. And now I have the distance on the city streets. Okay, so how, so that speed is going to be 30. So the time is going to be a bit longer for the distance. And what is that distance? Okay, that was A, this was X. Pythagoras is the great leveler of mathematics. It's, that's the, that's the distance in the, on the city streets. And now, what do I do? I've got an expression for the time. This is the quantity I, I'm trying to minimize. I minimize it by taking its derivative and set the derivative to zero. Take the derivative and set the derivative to zero. So now this is where I use the formulas of calculus. So the derivative. Now I'm ready to write the derivative. And I'll set it to zero. So the derivative of that, b is a constant, so I have minus 1 60th. Is that OK? Plus whatever the derivative of this is. Well, I have a 30th. I will take the constant first. Now I have to deal with that expression. That is some quantity square root. Square root is the one half power. So I have one half times this quantity to one lower power. That's the minus one half power. That means that the that it, I still have a square root, but now it's a minus one half power. It's down here. And then the chain rule says, don't forget the derivative of what's inside, which is 2x. OK, depending what order you've seen these vi uh, videos and read text, you know the chain rule, or you see it now. It's a very, very valuable rule to find derivatives as the function gets complicated. And the thing to remember, there will be a proper discussion of the chain rule. It's so important. But you're seeing it here that the thing to remember is take the, also the derivative of what's inside, the a squared plus x squared, and the derivative of the x squared is the 2x. OK, and then I have to set to 0. And of course, I'm going to cancel the twos. And I'll set it to zero. What, what does that mean, set to zero? Here's something minus, here's something plus. I guess what I really want is to make them equal. Those, if when those are, when these, when the 1 60th equals this messier expression, at that point, the minus term cancels the plus term. I get zero for the derivative. So I'm, I'm looking for derivative equals zero. That's where, that's my equation now. OK, now I just have to solve it. All right. Let's see. If I, if I wanted to solve that, I would probably multiply through by 60. Can I do this? I'll multiply both sides by 60. That will cancel the 30 and leave an extra 2, so I'll have a 2x here. And uh, let me multiply also by this miserable square root that's in the denominator to get it up there. I think, I think that's what I've got. That's the same equation as this one. Just simplify. Multiply through by 60. Multiply through by square root of a squared plus x squared. And it's looking good. All right, how am I going to solve that? Well, the only mess up is the square root. Get rid of that by squaring both sides. So now I square both sides, and I get a squared plus x squared. And the square of 2x is 4x squared. All right, now I have an equation that's way better. In fact, even better if I subtract x squared from both sides. My equation is telling me that a squared should be 3x squared. In other words, this good x is, now I'm ready to take the square root and find x itself. So put the 3 here, take the square root, 
I'm getting a over the square root of 3. So there is a word problem, a minimum problem, where we had to create the function to minimize, which was the time, trying to get to work as quickly as possible after naming the key quantity x, then taking the derivative, then simplifying, and it took a little, that's where the little work of calculus comes in. In the end, getting something nice, solving it, and getting the answer a over square root of three. So we now know what to do, driving in, if there's entrance where we want to get it. And actually, it is a beautiful answer. The, if this is a over the square root of 3, this will turn out to be 30 degrees, pi over 6, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. So that's the conclusion from calculus. Drive at a 30 degree angle, hope that there's a road going that way. Sorry about that point. And join the turnpike and probably the reason for that nice answer, 30 degrees, came, I, I can't help but imagine that because I chose 30 and 60 here, a ratio of 1 to 2, and then somehow the fact that the sine of 30 degrees is 1 half, you know, those two facts have got to be connected. So I could, if I change these 30 and 60 numbers, I'll change my answer, but basically the picture won't change much. And, and there's another little point um, to make to really complete this problem. It could have happened that the distance on the turnpike was very small and that this was a dumb move. That 30 degree angle could be overshooting MIT if, if MIT was like there. So that's a case in which the minimum time didn't happen where the derivative bottomed out. It, 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 if MIT was here, the good, the good idea would be go straight, go straight for it. Go x, you know, just the, the extra part on the turn, you wouldn't drive on the turnpike at all. And that's a signal that somehow in the graph, which I didn't graph this function, but if I did, then this stuff would be locating the minimum of the graph. But this extra example where you go straight for MIT would be a case in which the minimum is at the end. And of course that could happen. You could have a graph that just goes down and then it ends. So the minimum is there, even though the graph looks like it's still going down, the graph ended. What can you do? That's the best point there is. Okay, so that is a, can I recap this lecture? Coming first over here. So the lecture is about maximum and minimum, and we learn which it is by the second group. So then we had examples. There was an example of a minimum when the second derivative was positive. Here was an example of a local maximum when the second derivative was negative. Here with the sine and cosine, those are nice examples. And it takes some patience to go through them. I, I, I suggest you take a, another simple function, like start with cosine x. Find its maximum, find its minimum, find its inflection points. So the inflection points are where the bending is zero because it's changing from bending one way to bending the other way. We didn't need an inflection to test, so actually I didn't complete the lecture, because I didn't compute the second derivative and show that this was truly a minimum. I could have done that. I would have had to take the derivative of this, which would be one level messy, and look at its sine. I wouldn't have to set it to zero. I would be looking at the sine of the second derivative. And in this problem, it would safely come out 
positive sign, meaning bending upwards, meaning that this point I've identified by all these steps was truly the minimum time, not a maximum. Okay, that's a big part of important calculus applications. Thanks. This has been a production of MIT OpenCourseWare and Gilbert Strang. Funding for this video was provided by the Lord Foundation. To help OCW continue to provide free and open access to MIT courses, please make a donation at ocw.mit.edu slash donate. Okay, what our Professor Albert Gubenstrein had just done is to help us to understand sections 3.5. Now, ask yourselves very important questions. Do you remember what is the purpose of getting the maximum and the minimum? Why do we need that? Okay? Why do we need that? First of all, if you turn to your page 146, okay? Okay, when you look at that, definitions, you need to read the definitions, the maximum and the minimum value. Right, uh, well, this let is... Me, let me just stop that first. This will be reserved for first day. Okay? Now, turn to page 147. Now, go through the this definitions. The okay, day or the function that... Very good. Later, okay. Right, so page 147. Now, read from your textbook the definitions of maximum and minimum first, okay? Then, you go to the middle half of page 147 and take a good look at the theory number one. Maximum and minimum value property, okay? Property. In the discussions provided by Professor Gilbert Stride, he introduces to the context of bending. Now, what is bending related to? Second derivative, okay? So, second derivative, you know that. And when bending happens, when it bends upward, what does it mean? When it bends upward, what does it mean? It goes from the minimum up. When it bends downward, what does it mean? The maximum down. So when it bends down, what is going to be positive? When it bends up, is it going to be negative? Now I would like you to take a look at page 147. Okay? So figure 3.5.2 and figure 3.5.3. Okay? Over there, you have the high point, and you also have the low point. And you can see what is meant by bend up, and then what is meant by bend down. Okay? So, and then he emphasized very much the idea of not just the maximum or minimum, but the local maxima and the local minima. Why is the term local important here? Why is the term no for important here? Okay? Now you have to pay attention because we're interested in the instantaneous. Okay? Rate of change. And when we look at the whole graph, the many maximum point minimum points here. So if you turn to page 148, there we have the theory number two, no code maxima and minima, okay? So make sure you do not miss those very important things. Now, the interesting things about that is when we introduce the idea, close the interval, now, which is not discussed here in the video, but when you turn to page 149, when the key for adjective close the interval, was introduced, then you can see that theory number three is an absolute maxima and minima. It's like local, okay? So you have to study that uh, couple of things. I do not expect you to fully follow all the proofs there, but you have to get the ideas clarified. And then look for yourself where is the term infraction point discovered in your text chapter 3, 3.5? Try your very best. Where can you find? On which page? 
You can find the key term, inflection point. But those of you who are smart enough to have already turned to the index to see if there is it, we're in this point here. Okay, so any suggestions? Inflection point, where you can see no ending. Okay, where can you find it? Just a couple pages. You got it? Now, I'll leave it to you, but you can always find another very interesting term on the section 3.5, which is called the critical point. The critical point. Okay? So, is there any difference between the critical point and the inflection point? Now, make sure you do some homework, okay? I would like you to just make sure you have finished reading section 3.5. I'll give you some time for that. I, I, I love to see many of you who got the PDF versions of your textbook. I don't. Do you have to pay for that? <laughs> Those of you who got the PDF version, please check it to see if you can find the infraction points there. All right? Let's take a look at this. Here we go. What's the conclusions in your searching? Can you find a keyword in fraction form from the PDF versions? You got a PDF versions? Can you check? You must have a search functions there. You got PDF versions? Don't? Uh -oh. All right. And this is a small assignment on top of you what you need to handle on Wednesday. Okay? So make sure you understand the meaning of inflection point where no bending occur and oftentimes when you bend up or bend down, over there you can see that. And it is related with second derivative. Okay. Now I will install week number six by this evening. So you can see I'm actually going back to week number five, just now I go to the before class, week number five, because that is the material. It's supposed to be uh, covered last week, but you can see that we are going to do revisit of that. We just finished reviewing the big picture calculus in the context of maximum and minimum, which has had something to do with the second derivative. Uh, using Professor Gilbert Strand, video is very important. Okay, now, the reasons why it's important is because in this coming quiz on Wednesday, we do cover 3.5, it's actually 3.3, 3.4, and 3.5, the three sections. So take a look at the teacher's message of today that I sent out for last week. You can see that. But this coming grids on Wednesday is three sections, 3.3, 3.4, and 3.5, to make sure you do some review on section 3.5. It will contain the very interesting question only one. But when you look at 3.5, the idea is, why do we need the sections? Okay, why do we need the sections? And, um, just go through the materials covered by Professor David Jerison's lecture one, two, three, four, five, six, again, okay, even seven. Looks like he has not touched this topic at all. You remember that? Okay? But in the context of your textbook, this topic is put in 3.5, and we skip it, and we cover all the others until we come back. Okay, so, and then if you look at the arrangement of the textbook offer, immediately after the sections, 3.6 tells you something about the optimizations problem. So it really has something to do with the applications. Okay, so this is the, this is the hinge I would like to provide you. Okay, 
and check on this, how many of those questions you're going to study, particularly that one on page 155, okay? The investigations, when is your coffee cup spilled? Okay, um, the specific ideas on this. So, this week, when you're turning in your homework number four, it contained 10 specific questions, which contain 3.6, three questions, 3.7, three questions, and 3.8, four questions. And you will have your next quiz after this Wednesday, after your Chinese New Year's holiday, okay? And I wish you wonderful Chinese New Year holiday. Okay? Red packet. Yeah. Let's see if I can prepare one for each one of you. It will not be equal to money. It may be a tip. <laughs> wow, the eyes open already. Okay? So, one more thing. Go back to week number five. Okay? I hope many of you have already done this. It's important that we do not just keep on covering materials, but reminding you that these are the topics, okay? These are the topics that have already been covered so far. That means, I hope that you make the best use of the Chinese New Year's holiday and try to go through them, okay? Watch them once. This will be considered as the tutorial. And then the seven major lectures, okay? With the notes here, okay? And if you want to know what each lecture covers and what are some of the problems illustrated, you come back to this table, okay? Read and study each one of these problems and the solutions, okay? As well as listen to these simple workout example, just five to seven minutes each, called the recitation sections, okay? And these are very good and useful things. Okay, that means after your quiz this Wednesday. Don't worry much about it. I hope you make the best use of this organized resources. And then take a good look at the chapters in your textbook, particularly 3.7 and 3.8. Okay, let's say yes, 3.7 and 3.8. Um, we are going to help you to reinforce the idea on 3.2 and 3.3 um, using the scripts. So the product rule the reciprocal rule, the cosines rule, the chain rule will be covered in this Wednesday's words. Okay? Um, the basic idea of continuity, okay? The basic ideas of discontinuity, okay? So this will not be covered in this particular quiz. So please pay attention to those very important concepts. Okay, allow me to take attendance for today. Oh yes, before I do that, let me make sure I remember this. Okay, for those of you who have been online frequently, I have to say thank you very much. For those of you who have not been online frequently, please make sure you understand this. This is our system of submitting your homework electronically, okay? Now, you have to submit your homework physically with the TA, but after that, you need to give a record of the submissions based on this. Like on every Wednesday, if you have homework assignment, you scan your homework assignment using one PDF file. You submit your homework assignment to the TA, and then you submit your PDF file right here. So, assignment number four here, and at the end of receiving your graded homework. Now, listen very carefully because many of you did not do it. When I count the number of homework I got from here, particularly the graded homework, many of you did not turn in the graded homework. This is going to be difficult for me because I want to make sure that I match up the grade between I, the grade I received from the TA and the grade you submitted here. So make sure even though now it's late, you have to submit your graded homework because it's a very important record, okay? And this is for your graded quiz, okay? So by this Wednesday, 
you should drop back to grade number two. And if you have not submitted back to scan the grade a uh, grade quiz number one, make sure you do it also. I did not say it's not going to accept your submissions now, but you will definitely have a, have a record there if you submit name is indicated as late. I uh, not tell you that what kind of penalty is. Normally there's no penalty, but if you did not submit it here, you may not get your grade clarified clear towards the end of the semester, okay? So make sure you understand it's important that each one of you submit your homework here before handing it to your TA and the grade homework here, your grade grades here, and your journals here, okay? It's important record. Oh, one more thing. I was reminded just before I came here. Remember to alert your, your students that if your attendance in this class is not up to 80%, you will not be allowed to sit for the final exam. Okay? This is important. I think you know it. But I have to tell you one more thing. You do not miss the class. So when I think attendance is very important. Alright? So, now let me finish the attendance call and then we can go.
discuss with the TA about any gains? Can you send me an email? Okay. Now, I'm using Dr. Matt's QA hotline for this week. Okay? Right here, right here. Yes, yes. That's very important record, okay? Yes, okay. Uh, week number six. You will see that uh, by the end of today, okay? Because right now we just got to week number five. So when you see week number six, just go to Dr. Matt's QA hotline, week number six, and send me a message there. Okay. I thought I, uh, well, okay, uh, tell you in person. No, we need a record. We need a record. Okay. That's the most important. If you tell me in person, I forget about too many things. Mm -hmm. The record over there is very important. Because we need. Uh, I have a question. Why do you have to submit the assignment before grade and after grade? Uh, actually, one is enough, after grade is enough. But the reasons why you need to submit before grade to help those students happen to forget to turn into the TA physically. You see the meaning of that? You remember last time the yes, student is saying if we have to make to many chores we will have less time to spend on You see, because uh, we need to keep what we call a cost portfolio for all the students. You see, the cost portfolio of all the students include the homework, the grades, the tests. You see that the meaning. In the past, the office would do this for us, but now we have to do it our, on our own. So the, the most important thing, the most convenient thing is... Yeah. 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 Do that for us. Individual students who, yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 but we need an electronic record. An electronic record could the best be done is shared by each student. That's the very simple principle. Because in the past, when we look at in, in the US, this is what we have to do. Because in the in the library, you have the photocopy machines. We keep one record. We submit the physical or two record to the TA. Okay, and the reason why I'm going to submit it on the same day is because in case you forgot to submit the TA, the record here shows that you submit during the day, the, the TA has to grade and you don't consider that you submit something late. That's the whole principle. Yes. Yes. No, but it's still important because from the, you understand what happened. Do you remember the, the student at that time? He came to us. I forgot to submit my homework to the TA. And I asked her the question, have you submitted your electronic form? She said, yes. And at that, I was sending an email to the TA. That she submitted electronically on time. So even though she did Uh, no, because the TA has to grade it, okay? And on the other hand, no, it's not that complicated because you, you have to understand that. So the TA and I works differently in different office, okay? And uh, in the past, I would collect the whole batch and send it to the TA. Uh, but traditionally speaking, students would bring the homework to the TA and submit it, okay? So, but. In the past, if students bring the homework to the TA and submit to the TA, the instructor will not have the record. Now, the school required us to keep what we call a course portfolio of students' work. So the, the one way we can do it is to invite each student, mm -hmm. okay, beside they submit the homework to the TA, scan a copy. When they scan a copy, they will keep a copy on their own, submit it electronically, and the TA will not have the physical to come to my office. To, to do it because that is during the tutorial. Now, I think it has to be collaborations, collaborations between student and the teachers and the TA. So, by going to the library to scan it, do you think it's a big tool? 
It's already, it's already. This is the day. This is the day to submit it. But even though you did not submit on time, no penalty on that. A lot of students. Yeah. I, I want to submit earlier because I get the. Great no, this is the great homework. This is the great homework. Wednesday, and I have yeah. to. Uh, if I get. Oh, you mean you mean the not great homework and you extend it earlier? You mean that? Yes, because I can. Okay, that that that's reasonable. That's reasonable. Yes, because then I can. Submit Work and uh, new homework together, scan it together, and something oh. Okay, now if you want to make this flexible, say this is the physical day when you have to submit the homework to the DA. Because when I, I can actually, actually extend Wednesday. this, I can actually yeah. extend this, stay studying from Sunday to Wednesday, at least three days for that, you can submit it three days earlier. That's okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reason is because we have to solve this to the faculty. The students have to submit the work um, based on a schedule like this. Although we also have to respect on the traditional practice of submitting over on tutorial. So towards the end of the semester, I need to extract homework from this to show that this is the way we collect homework, this is the way we manage the greater homework. Uh, you see that very soon, each student will be given what we call a personal record, electronic record online. You can come on Hudo on this electronic record and check your grade. Okay? Uh, this is based on a standard topic. Um, this is what we call um, internal audit for uh, academic evidence of learning. You see that? Because we have to show to the school, the department, that during the course of this learning, students have to do something and submit the work. And we have to say that this are the area of homework, and this is the area of the quiz, and also uh, the journals, and then for the, for the test paper. The test paper, we have to scan it for you, because we, we do not let you do it. Uh, we scan it and then return it, or something like that, find exam or something like that. How about the quiz? I am not sure whether it's due. Well, basically, we expect that because, no, look at that. The quiz is due one day after Wednesday. Okay? This is often, take a look at the day. This is Wednesday, this is Thursday. This is Wednesday, this is Thursday. That is two dates. Mm -hmm. Right? So, what you are asking for but is quiz actually. One and quiz two, I'm not sure. Whether it's still there because I get and I know where I did wrong and I collect it and I have, have they given you have they given you right yes already keep my grade so I don't think I should keep it because I already know what I'm doing. No, no, no. Whether or not you keep it, it's that the fiscal paper is your choice, but we need to keep it in the electronic copy for you. Oh but the yeah. two quiz maybe is through. But you miss one, right? You miss one quiz, right? Um, you missed the first one, right? You just did the second one, right? So, if you have any questions on the quiz, please let me know. For example, are you sure why you did it wrong? Or have the, have the tutor given you uh, justified marking? Because for me, I did not grade the quiz myself. This is the TA's work, okay? I would take a look at the grade, and I would take a look at individual paper when the student raised questions about it. Because normally, they divide the work. I have to be here designing the whole course of learning. The 
the TA would do all the screening, but I have to collect them together, and towards the end of the semester, I will look, take a look at the whole work done by the students, and then provide what we call a formative assessment based on the, the homework grade and the quiz grade, and we'll take a look at the homework paper and the quiz paper. But from the two quizzes and from the homeworks given, you should see basically the quiz questions and the homework problem are not much different. They are not the same. They are not much different. Okay? As I said, and we will compare the, the, the working between your homework problem and your quiz problem and see if you understand really the context there. Yeah, that, that, that's one idea. How about the quiz paper is missing? Well, not, I can't do anything if you miss the quiz paper. The graded. The graded. I only have the, no, oh, I only have the, 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 the result from the TA. I do not have the quiz paper from the TA. So because the TA return the quiz paper for you. Mm -hmm. And so if you do not submit your scan copy here, mm -hmm. I can only take the grade from the TA that's mm -hmm. valid. No, no. For the school, it's not enough. The school would like to take a look at the actual paper written by the student. Okay? That is very important. When the exam board comes here, we must lay all the paper on the table and they examine it. This is very important. You cannot say it's enough. The exam board will say it's not enough and we are not going to accredit it. Yeah, internal assessment and also external assessment. Because you are taking a specific course offered by the Department of Mathematics, right? Mm -hmm. And your work must be kept here. It's not just a grade. The, how you write the answer. I mean, so if you do not submit your standard uh, quiz paper here, uh, there is a likelihood they will not accept the grade as it is. Okay? Just a likelihood. <laughs> no, because you see the regulations is coming up. Each year at the University of Macau, we are upgrading our status. Right now, we are one of the 300... I think it is a very strict regulation. It will only lower the efficiency. I don't, I don't see any advantage. I'm sorry. If you choose the University of Macau, we are following the international rules. Mm -hmm. You can talk to the Department Head of Mathematics and give her your view, but this is what we have to do because we are now one of the 300 universities in the world recognized worldwide. Oh, 300. yes. Just a ranking. I think I no, should take the the rank, the, the rank. I like your way to yeah. be honest. Yeah. You are in the yeah. of learning. I appreciate it very yeah. much. But you see, we have to follow the regulations provided by, by the department, because when I, as I said today, yeah. why I have the to remind you. is inflexible. Human. No, you have to understand we need to follow the rules. Just now, if I did not inform the student 80% of the attendant, it's required to write for the uh, final exam, and if they say that the teacher has not informed us in class, then I have not been doing a good job. For example, if you believe this is not necessary, you can go to the department head. But for me, when I take up the teaching of this course, this is what I have to produce for them to look at. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> you understand the meaning of that? <laughs> if I do not produce something like this, I'm not doing my job. Okay. Okay. This okay. Is the, 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 you understand that? It's very important. So you ask a very good question. Uh, suppose mm -hmm. uh, the student's scanned Chris paper is not here, mm -hmm. but just the grade. What mm -hmm. should I do? Mm -hmm. I, I will follow the question to the department. If he said no, you, the, the scanned paper is not here, you should not give them a grade, and I can't give you. So you will yeah, definitely, because I'm here to help teach the course. I must follow their regulations. Oh. Their advice is very important. So yeah, it's a likelihood. Yes, <laughs> that's the reason I'm doing yeah. all this. If you submit it late, this is something I can manage. But if you did not submit it, and what if they ask for this, when I cannot produce, then that's the big problem. You see the meaning of that? So that is a, that's why I say, um, some of the teachers will do it this way. They will not return the quiz paper to the student, but just take, let them take a look at it. And then they will keep all the quiz paper. Mm -hmm. But learning cannot be done that way. So I'm just giving you the flexibility and I'm reminding you of studying in this way that all of these are very important. Mm -hmm.
if I if I strict the system will say you cannot submit anything beyond the deadline, but now even if it's beyond, you still can submit it. For me, if we get that, give the power to TA to hold a quiz, then we will trust them. So but they would have they return the quiz paper to you? Yes. But that, 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 that's, that, that's how they do it. But once they return the paper to you, then you have to scan and put it here. Then you have your paper. We have to scan copy, and the TA can finish the job degree. That's what we have to do, mm -hmm. right? So I think that if you need some more time, as I said, here is flexible. As long as you submit here, even though this deadline is passed, I still get a seven. But the reason why this day is important because this is the ex uh, this is the day that this quits. This is the day that this quits, and after that we have another day for another quits. So that means you. Periodically, you need to clear the batches. But as a teacher, I'm just trying to help you the best. But well, let me tell you this: one thing that is very important. By doing this, you only have advantage because you can always have a copy of your work. But you, I will you, never see it after I finish this job. I will maybe move on calculus second, calculus two. Oh, maybe oh, no, I will no, no. stop. No, that's it's, why I will step forward to step backward. It, it, it's okay. It's okay. It's very up to you. Do you understand the meaning of a student portfolio? Yes, but I think rigor is something you have something important. For example, rigor exam or final exam. No, it's exam. not just the grade. But it's not every. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's not every because it's very important, as I said, as a teacher. For example, later on, you, you ask me to write a reference letter to you. What if I forgot you? I'll go back to this, pause and run, take a look at your work before I write a reference letter. This is very important for a teacher. <laughs> this is the way we do it. Yes, thank you. Make sure you don't you, you keep that because we 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 know that uh, it's okay, it's troublesome. But yes. So how 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 should I write this email? When should I? Um, by, uh, by tomorrow. Uh, so when are you going to miss this class? You're going to miss a class, right? No class. Uh, please. Okay. Have, um, this, this Wednesday. Wednesday. This Wednesday. Yes. You're going to miss another quiz. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you're okay. going to miss this quiz, uh, remember you're not going to take the quiz again. But the only possibility is to to move the grade of this quiz. Mm -hmm. To become right, on the average of yes, yes, yes. That's one way. Uh, because we receive this application uh, again. You have any conference of the class time? We have to go to another lecture. Yes, it's an additional lecture. Okay. About have you told Have you told this uh, teachers to give a quiz? Yes. Okay. So uh, make sure you s you write me this message, and this is the lady, the lecturer's name, right? Right. And her email address. And yes, and also give me the um, the the course title. Okay. Uh, course and the course title, title the, the name, and something like this, and so that I could respond to her, and also respond to you, and send a message to the TA. Okay. okay. So you have to make sure you send. Okay. Do it this way. First, send me an email. Mm -hmm. Okay. Email or hotline. First, send me an email as soon as possible, and when you see the hotlines come up. Copy your email into your hotline. Okay. Okay. You. That will help a lot. So, because these are the regulations, and I hope that you understand the meaning of that. All right. So, I don't miss it. Have you submitted all of these necessary things so far? Uh, yes. Except for quiz. Except for quiz number one. Mm -hmm. Now remember, for quiz number one, it's too late to do anything because you miss it already. But you're going to miss another quiz, mm -hmm. right? You, you you did this quiz, right? Yes. So you're going to miss quiz number three. So make sure you send the email to me as soon as today. Okay. okay? So otherwise I cannot do anything to help. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, I did not turn off my <laughs> camera yet. All right. We're so all right. Uh, that's it for today's MATV oh, one one zero section one calculus one until this first day. Stay in tune. Okay. I'll see you. All right.